Welcome, neighbors and friends, to Woodbury Community Room. I'm Stephen Murphy, a member of Woodbury Community Library Board of Trustees. On behalf of the trustees, I'm pleased to introduce the event tonight, a reading of poetry and fiction by Woodbury resident and author Mary Gangemi. In my belief, we all are so fortunate to be together in this community, at this gathering, like so many of our gatherings, to share information, ideas, and stories, to understand that which makes us different, and to appreciate that which makes us united. So, we wish to thank, for organizing and promoting this event, Library Director Myrna Miranda O'Neill and Hardwick <laughs> Community Television. Thank you. Now, to introduce our featured guest. Mary Gangemi has been a resident of Woodbury for 22 years. She has served the town as library director, and more recently as a lister. Mary has a Master of Arts degree in Comparative Literature from San Francisco State, and a Master of Fine Arts degree from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Mary is a contributor to Lambda Literary, an online journal that reviews LGBTQ books and authors. Tonight, Mary will be reading excerpts from her poetry manuscript, Fog Blue Wood, the short story titled, The Night I Met Bill Casey, a dystopian short story titled, After Sartre, and an excerpt from her novella, Valerie and Martin. So, please let us welcome Mary Ganjem. Thank you. There is a change. I'm not going to read the. Um, the what? No, I have that. Um, I forget what it was. Oh, Valerie Martin. I didn't bring Valerie Martin. I brought other things. Um, Today I got my copy of Lesbian Connection, and uh, in it were two obituaries, one from, one about uh, Urvashi Viad, who is a uh, lesbian feminist uh, philosopher and thinker who wrote um, Virtual Equality way back in the 80s and early 90s when she talked about how the mainstreaming of lesbian and gay culture was not maybe such a good thing because it erased and subsumed a lot of our culture. And we no longer have a lot of the social clubs, the bars, the restaurants, the gatherings, the house parties that we used to have. And it's, the movement has morphed into a, um, um, a sensual sexual revolution rather than one of equal rights and um, egalitarianism. Um, the other person who passed away was Elena Dyke woman who had um, been a mentor to me. And <clears throat> I was very sad about that. I didn't know, that was a surprise. I knew about Urvashi, but not about uh, Alana. So I wanted to honor them. Um, <clears throat> because through, through everything, I mean, we have these connections with people and places and ideas and schools of thought, and it keeps us curious and busy and engaging and troubled. It makes us ask why, why not, you know, all those things. All right, enough of that. So this is one of my first poems that I ever had published. And it is simply called Burning. I was 12 then. 
Spring in the city meant longer days and more to do. I had fallen in love with a classmate's cousin, wrote a story about it, said carefully in the Old West, but they found it. My sisters and their friends, that day, warm city sun, everything smelling green, traffic moving through the park. It was the first time I burned myself, page after page, over the garbage can in the alley. And this one is entitled Dance Me. It was written uh, quite a few years after this one. Shortly after you left, the Berlin Wall crumbled. And I went out with women who taught me how to dance. Very early one cold winter morning, I stood outside with a friend. The air was pulsing. A moon was slung low in the rigid sky. And she showed me the key to her new apartment, shining like a jewel in the palm of her hand. And of course, this was someone who I'd gotten out of a domestic violence situation. OK. The night I met Bill Casey, this actually happened. This truly actually happened. I did meet Bill Casey, you know, the CIA guy. Oh. And um, well, anyway, <laughs> here it is. The drive to Locust Valley was interminable. 80% humidity, a yellow-green haze over the Long Island Expressway, and my almost father-in-law, Edmund, behind the wheel, bleeding his horn like the rest of the stalled herd. Edmund was a diminutive man, but he was nobody's fool. After the war and his stint as an OSS interrogator, Edmund had taught high school French. He was a Goldwater conservative who eventually assumed and held on to control of the Hudson County GOP for more than 20 years. He was a widow widower and a teetotaler, the latter a crusade. He only drove Chevrolets, and he never exceeded the speed limit. When I began to date his son, Nathaniel, he was delighted, but soon displeasure was evident. After all, I was a registered Democrat, a nascent feminist, and not WASP. Anyway, there we were, creeping towards Locust Valley, while WNEW FM purred on through the radio, and planes from JFK screamed overhead. I had been invited by Edmund's friend Sophia to spend a month at her summer home in Locust Valley, a Tony enclave not far from Teddy Roosevelt's Oyster Bay home. I was 21 years old, engaged, and already treading water in a role that was devolving into something inexplicably disturbing. Regardless of the affection I felt towards Nathaniel, who was eight years my senior, I carried uneasiness in my chest, a sense that something wasn't quite right. No matter how wonderful he was, he was also ambitious and privileged. When there was tension between us, I attributed it to occasional bouts of impatience, to circumstances rather than temperament. He had swept me off my feet into a circle that I found both exciting and intimidating. Needless to say, I was thrilled by the invitation, as well as this one, four weeks at Rock Hollow Farm. Sofia Acampo was an elegant Argentine Parisian, married some 30 years to one Frederick Rodier, whose family fortune was built on the backs of South Africa's diamond miners. Rodier had known Edmund since World War II and the OSS, but Fred, as Edmund referred to him, had cast Sofia aside and taken up with one Olga Baranzek, an expatriate Polish lawyer who was the same age as his son. Sophia refused to give Frederick a divorce, carrying on as if Fred's affair was mere annoyance, which according to Edmund, it was. Sophia could be careless about pretense. Everyone knew what Olga and Fred were up to, and quite frankly, Olga and Fred didn't faze me. I was intrigued by what Edmund and Sophia meant to each other. I didn't understand why I had been invited, but the chance to get out of the city and Wright felt like an adventure I didn't want to miss. 
So why do you think she invited me? I asked Nathaniel the night before I left. Because she likes you. She hardly knows me. Through the phone, I could hear Nathaniel's pause. Then he sighed, don't read anything into it. He finally said, she likes you. Leave it at that. Five, five hours after leaving New Jersey, we drove through the gates of Sophia's farm. At the end of a long gravel driveway, we pulled up to the house. This so-called summer cottage was next to the Double Days. It was large, rambling, cedar-shaped, with a four-car garage, groundkeeper's cottage, greenhouse, guest house, large secluded in-ground swimming pool, and more. But more about the pool later. Sophia was conferring with her groundskeeper, Jack Bird. Edmund beeped the horn, and Sophia and Jack turned around. At this point in my story, I suppose I should write, a beautiful smile bloomed across Sophia's face. But that would sound ridiculous and betray my naivete and awkwardness. As it was, I had a very hard time meeting people. I did not know, let alone understand, how her smile really did bloom across her face. I wonder if calling the police is necessary, she exclaimed, turning around, moving around the car to greet us. So our budding poet has arrived, she exclaimed. Welcome to the farm, Helen. She turned to Edmund, you are late as usual, she said. Police, what for, he asked. Some punks tore up one of the flower beds along the east end of the property, completely destroyed the Angelica. What is Angelica? My Aunt Han Harry, short for Henrietta, would have been all over Jake Bird like a cheap suit, asking questions about flower beds and grape arbors, but not me. The guardian of the garden, Sophia said rather legally, but for now, let's just get you both settled. <clears throat> As if on cue, the housekeeper appeared. Bring Helen's bags to the green room, <laughs> she told the housekeeper. Edmund, you were in the carriage house. I'm laughing because this was so long ago. <laughs> and one scarcely identify, I mean, cannot recognize the persona behind it anyway. <laughs> Sophia had the voice of Capuchin and the physiognomy of Lauren Bacall. I looked and sounded more like Annie Hall, with short hair intended towards baggy chinos and oversized Oxford shirts. A fashion failing for a young woman that was hardly appreciated by Republicans, circa 1973. But I was interested in everything, which gave me a certain latitude I took full advantage of. I followed the housekeeper. What's your name? I asked her. Perla, she said. Perla Mula. <laughs> oh, I like that, I said. I told her she led me upstairs. Spanish and German? No, she said Brazilian and German. She put my suitcase on a stand at the foot of the bed. Let me know if you need anything, she said, and left. I stood there for a moment, looking at the closed door, a nebulous sense of discomfort hanging in the air. What ruins are in me that can be found, I thought, remembering my Shakespeare. I was still standing there when Sophia knocked. Come in, she, I called, and she opened the door. So she said, do you like this room? This was my room until I was married. She went to the curtains and began to adjust how long is it since you've been here, I asked. Much longer. My grandfather built this house over 80 years ago. It has always been my favorite place to be. OK, now I'm going to skip to the dinner scene. Later that evening, we sat down to a casual supper in the screened-in porch. Edmund, awash with references to Solzhenitsyn, dominated the conversation for most of the meal, dragging his reductive government ideology along with him to the veranda, where we had coffee and lemon poppy seed cake. Eventually, Edmund finished his analysis of post-Nixon America and turned his attention to Ronald Reagan. He had high hopes for Reagan's candidacy, proclaiming him the most impressive candidate the country ever had. More impressive than FDR, I asked. Edmund stirred his coffee. Roosevelt was a Democrat. Well, I know that, but he did lead us out of the Great Depression. He was a socialist, a traitor to his class. I pulled a face, which made Sophia laugh. The renegade of the Roosevelt, she quipped. 
Speaking of which, Edmund, why don't we go to Oyster Bay tomorrow? Teddy's summer cottage is an interesting day trip. Well, you know I'll be leaving after lunch. Yes. She turned to me. Helen is an idealist, Edmund. Right, he said, droll and annoyed. My only daughter-in-law, a bright-eyed idealist. I was surprised at how his words stung. Tell us about Nixon, Sophia said, changing the subject and giving me a sympathetic wink. He's coming back strong, Edmund said. They should have impeached the bastard, I thought. Everybody wants to see him, Edmund droned. He'll be back sooner than we thought. Sophia listened, and I struggled to stifle my yawns and revive my dwindling attention span. Go to bed, Sophia said shortly after midnight. I excused myself and went upstairs. Don't tell me about, don't tell me I lost my place. Okay, Bill Casey was very tall and pale. He had a long, unpleasant face. His cheeks were flaccid and poxy. His handshake was limp and cool. His wife was unassuming and very nice. After an hour or so, we went into the dining room. Sophia sat me on her right across from Mrs. Casey. Bill Casey took the seat at the opposite end of the table. The dining room was cool and dark. Candles illuminated the table. Several bottles of wine stood on the sideboard. From the kitchen, I could hear Perla moving about. I began to feel small and hypervigilant, as if I was moving down a dimly lit hallway and could not find any doors. Casey argued and droned throughout the entire meal. Sophia was aggressive or vexed. She challenged Casey several times, particularly about money and Reagan's candidacy. Mrs. Casey said very little, but smiled. And then I thought of a question. Don't you think Nixon was guilty? I asked. Mrs. Casey looked at me. For a moment or two, no one said anything, and then Bill said, what the left has done to Nixon is despicable. There has to be respect for what Richard Nixon has done for this country. You will do well to think of that. Than what, I thought. But I said, don't you think he went too far? Casey looked sharply. No, he said, he didn't go far enough. Then Mrs. Casey said, tell us, Helen, are you enjoying yourself? <laughs> yes, I answered very much. She asked me about running and what I had studied in college. <sighs> Bill Casey sniffed and smeared, speared some green beans. The tension hovering over the table was intense and frightening. I started to think of strings of words. Conflagration, I thought. Chastisement. Scintillating. Scorn. Sophia touched my arm and asked if I cared for anything more, and the word sensuous ran through me. Sensuous. Sensational. Secretive. Serious. Shame. Shattered. Shimmering. I felt myself redden and then took a drink of wine from the glass in front of me. The last word had made me blush, shimmering. Not sensuous or shame, but shimmering. I took another drink of wine. What happened next, while we were waiting for coffee, I thought was extraordinary. Mrs. Casey stood up and excused herself to freshen up. Would I care to join her? I was immovable. I was not leaving the table no matter how intense Bill Casey's anger hung in the air. Every nerve in me began to vibrate. <sighs> Feeling all right? Yes, I said, I'm fine. She nodded and then directed herself to Casey, who was still muttering on like a priest at high mass, mumbling incomprehensibly in Latin. But then they began to argue. Casey was louder, he was gesticulating. Sophia was angry. I looked from one to the other, wondering why Mrs. Casey was taking so long. <laughs> I saw how beautiful Sophia was, how fine the lines coursed her forehead, her simple, elegant hairstyle, her hands still smooth and unmarked, the way she was meeting Bill Casey head on, her beautiful dress. 
she had forgotten me. She was someone else. She was someone beyond the woman Bill Casey could not talk down. And then I felt fear. I realized I didn't understand what they were saying, even though I knew they were speaking English. Then they switched to French, and then Spanish, then back to English, which was more incomprehensible than the French. Their sentences had no structure. Words were scatterings and slivers of sound, sharp, stinging, empty, specious, elusive, vacuous. I looked from one to the other in bewilderment. I could not understand what they were saying. Then Sophia broke into a stream of fiery French. Casey stopped talking. He glared at her, enraged. Then he got up from the table, excused himself, and left the room. Sophia and I sat there. We heard him call to his wife, Perla rushing to get his umbrella, a rustling of hurried movement. The front door opened, the front door closed. Shortly after, Perla came into the coffee and quietly poured us each a cup. She asked if I wanted dessert. No, I said, nothing for me. <laughs> so I did, I did s skip a, a bit, but I was 21. I didn't have a clue <laughs> about all that politics stuff. OK, this is, <clears throat> do you want more poem, a poem or two? How about dreaming small thoughts? She told me her dreams were small thoughts, upended and demure. She told me they were frightening wildness. She told me memory had absconded with the one dream she had understood. I told her dreams were abandoned raindrops. I told her dreams could not be planned because they would fall into daylight, orphaned and angry. I told her that verbs trumped fear and nouns held up the sky. After the funeral, the churchyard wrapped fog. The world hushed inside the parsonage, spoons clink china cups, and conversations slip past, and all the participles in the eulogy had baffled me. A tiny tray of lemons captivated my attention as surely as the sunlight three hours later when I sat in the back seat Dad driving over the Driscoll Bridge to the white, blue-white mirror of the sea, and no one spoke. I watched a freight train crawl onto the southbound tracks, blowing slow and deep over the trestle of Raritan Bay. And years later, driving over that same bridge towards the ocean and the small house of my mother, I remembered the clinking of spoons and the faces suspended in fog Beyond the windows, thin whispers, a hollow cough, and sticky sweet sherry drops I sipped from abandoned glasses. Woodbury Quarry. Two peregrines sheared the sky above the lake. A breeze teased glitterings from the cold surface. It could have been any breeze strayed from a mountaintop or cast off the hump of a distant wave. The mind of eye in the mind of memory. The sensations coax a relief of recognition, like that old house key, just to turn it once again in my hand. I miss the 20th century because even if a woman doesn't, didn't have a hysterectomy or an abortion, her children would always punch plastic pimples on a plastic phone. Never slide the tip of a finger into the circle of a number and pull the dial south towards zero and let it round back north with the gearbox clicking. No button would make it. But would it make any difference in how we say hello? This one's 
I'm not going to do the dystopian one. It's too. Uh, it's. It, I, I couldn't do it justice because it's much longer than. Um, this is called. It's. It was so easy, and it's. It was also written after. Um, a spate of time that I was reading Sartre and um, Camus and Kafka and all those other German wonderkind, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche. It was so easy. Mind if I smoke? Not at all, said the detective, but you can't smoke in government buildings. A wide smile spread slowly across the prisoner's face. You don't smoke? The young detective shook his head. Too bad, the prisoner said. She hooked her thumbs under her suspenders and tipped back her chair, which creaked softly. As she rocked back and forth just a little, she was quite taken with him. From the very beginning, when the security police knocked on her door, the prisoner thought they were very polite. She found them charming, in a military sort of way, but their coats were well tailored and of good quality. The young detective cleared his throat. I'll leave you alone for a few minutes, he said. I'm sure you would like a few minutes to yourself. At this point, it's perfectly understandable. You think so, the prisoner asked. She looked up at him and watched as he straightened his tie. For the first time since they brought her in, she got a good look at him. He was very young, and his hair newly cut. Above his collar, the back of his neck was still red from the barber's clippers. He was not very tall or broad-shouldered. His tie was too thin for the size of his shirt collar, and in spite of his beautifully tailored suit, his pants were too short, and he was wearing bright yellow socks. I like your socks, she told him. He looked at her. My God, the prisoner exclaimed, he blushes. She clicked her tongue and rested a hand against her cheek. The detective was not amused. You have 15 minutes, he said. I suggest you make the most of them. But I can't smoke, or can I? I told you no. No, she countered. You said no smoking in government buildings. That's right. Well, take me outside. It's the least you can do. All right, but please don't talk to me. <laughs> you sound somewhat plaintive, the prisoner grinned. The detective walked over to the table and unlocked the chain that had been laced through, each, through a ring on each leg shackle. You are so kind, she said. Right, let's go. He took her down the hallway, past the squad captain's office. The captain was on the phone and paid no attention to the clinking of the leg irons and the shuffling gait of the prisoner. At the end of the hallway, the detective turned right and then opened a large, very heavy door. A shaft of sunlight struck the prisoner full in the face, and she hesitated. But the detective put his hand against her back and none too gently pushed her through the door. She shuffled over to the other side of the courtyard and then turned around to face him. The cigarettes were in my front, front pocket, she called out. She raised her cuffed hands and smiled as if she wanted him to ask her to dance. He walked over, she straightened up. Without looking at her face, he took the cigarettes and the matches out of her shirt pocket. Thank you, she said. Won't you tell me your name? He lit her cigarette and blew out the match, holding it in his hand until it was cool enough to put in his pocket, along with the cigarettes. No need, he said. He turned and walked away from the prisoner, crossing back to the courtyard door. From there, he watched her smoke. She studied him. He looked young, probably new at this, maybe his first assignment. She took a long, deep drag. Maybe arresting her was his first big break. He told, her people told her about this detective. The prisoner knew he hated the assignment, that his wife would much rather be in the South, that instead of sunny beaches and good restaurants, she was stuck in this miserable village in the North with its thatched stone houses and brightly colored doors, <clears throat> the only thing that hinted of beauty. The prisoner knew the detective's wife hated the villagers. She was bored. She was having an affair with the local pastor. This seems like too much for the prisoner to learn from hearsay. Is it really necessary to the story? That's an aside. 
the prisoner lifted her cuffed hands and ran a finger along a seam of mortar, casually but methodically. Her men had often wondered about the inside of the prison, but like all the others who were arrested and summarily dispatched, she would have no tales to bring back to them. She looked around at the expanse of brick and paving stones. The December afternoon was very cold, despite an entire day of bright sun and no wind. But the prisoner was oblivious to the cold. She wasn't a large woman, but she was sturdy and ruddy, her hair bleached by sun and salt. She looked up to see a flock of skulls squawking and turning in the hollow blue sky. In her statement, the prisoner said she was a fisherman. She had fished these waters since she was a girl. Her father had taught her. The detective had been very interested in that and called in his captain, who asked her repeatedly to explain why she became a fisherwoman. No matter how many times she corrected him, I am a fisherman, Captain. He ignored her and jotted down something in his notebook. She crouched down against the wall, the cigarette still in her lips, <clears throat> between her lips. She could feel the slight hint of heat against her back. Hey, the prisoner st <clears throat> was startled and stood up quickly. The detective walked over. Listen, you've got to stay standing. I need to see you clearly. No tricks. The prisoner smiled at him. What tricks do you think I have up my sleeve, she asked him. Shut up. Are you stupid? Do you think I don't know how to handle you? She smiled at him and took the cigarette out of her mouth. I'm finished with my cigarette, she said. What should I do with it? He hesitated and then snatched it from her. It's a filthy habit. The prisoner shrugged. Occupation is a filthy habit, too, she said. The detective threw the cigarette to the ground and stomped on it. Let's go. We haven't got all day. He took her back inside, but instead of returning to the interrogation room, he brought her to a small cell in the basement. There was no cell door to speak of, just a thick, barred gate, and the cell was empty except for a wooden bench set against the back wall, which was covered entirely, ceiling to floor, with a thick, sponge-like black pad. The prisoner's nose twitched from the heavy smell of urine and blood. It seemed as if the detective didn't even notice. You can wait here, he said very carefully. The captain will be ready shortly. She sat down on the bench. It's cold in here, she said. No matter, it won't be long, the detective sighed. No questions? No more questions? The detective shrugged. You know, detective, I can't call you detective, no. It was really easy to kill you people. I had no trouble at all. Most of you dogs don't, he said. But that doesn't make any difference, does it? How so? She asked, you have many cases like mine? <clears throat> he looked at her but said nothing. There is no need to feel bad, the prisoner said gently. I know you have things to do. Yes, he said. Most people in your great nation would, would agree with you about all this. All this? He crossed his arms and stared at her. Do you really think, do you, have you thought of all of how difficult this really is? I would think it has become easy for you, the prisoner said. Then again, nothing is easy in these circumstances. He stalked out of his cell and then turned. Why did you do it, he demanded. She shrugged. A curious sadness shone from her eyes, forcing the detective to turn away. They were silent for a few moments. You have never even said my name, she said. That is irrelevant. What? What is irrelevant? My name? My sex? My patriotism? Sit down, he yelled and pushed her. Then he moved several feet back and raised his gun. The prisoner watched him. They locked eyes. You will always remember this Christmas Eve, she said to him. His shot was clean. He knocked the prisoner back against the wall. Her face aghast, her eyes frozen. She slumped over and slid to the floor. The captain came into the room, and the two men stared at the blood snaking away from her body. Leave her, the captain said. They'll take care of her after Christmas. It's cold enough in here. 
she won't ripen. We don't have to move the body. The detective nodded. Lock up, the captain said. It's Christmas. Go home to your family. Outside the building, they shook hands. Merry Christmas, the captain said warmly. Merry Christmas, the detective replied. The captain looked around. No snow this Christmas. The detective nodded. The bus turned the corner and roared past them. I despise women who wear suspenders, the captain said. The detective nodded again. How many of our men did she kill? Seven? Twenty. Hannah Morganson killed 20 men. The captain whistled. Unbelievable, he exclaimed. 20 men. Well, the captain said, off with you and a Merry Christmas. The detective watched the captain walk to the end of the street and turn the corner. He took one long look at the building and reached under his top coat. He pulled Hannah Morganson's cigarettes out of a pocket and lit one. He threw the match onto the sidewalk and turned towards home. Oh, that's what Kafka will do. <laughs> Schopenhauer. My nephew is uh, just started college, and he's all excited about Wagner. And I'm like, yes, Wagner's music is beautiful, but what do you know about Wagner? <laughs> So we should have some interesting conversations. Um, oh, I still have time. Are oh, you still want to listen? <laughs> yes. Patty might remember this one. <laughs> might. Invitation. Light burst through like water pouring, sounded like water spilling into the room. That's how it would be remembered. An invitation held open, mother of pearl lined maw of an impossible seashell. She closed her eyes so ears could open, so mouth could taste what could not be seen, even if seeing was sight tasted. She could melt her own bones without wanting anything, frail fullness disappearing, deliciousness offered, light colliding between fingernails and toenails, wanting to breathe one last finite breath and know that breath before it was gone like a dream. Unfolding herself into lusciousness, she melted into her own textures, back arched for the furious, furious tongue. Without silence, thought escapes memory, coy and bereft, scantily clad, faint perseveration, begging for more, without fishing, without baiting the hook, filing the point, sound scraping skin, shaping whispers, the way whispers slide from woman to woman. She became silver, swallowed, ocean teeming, contrapuntal breathing, ragged, measured forgiveness. All her redemptions tied to cradle need, forgiven, forgotten whispers, words without vibration, silver syllables slipping into whispers the way whispers slide. Listen, she remembered that stretch of beach near the inlet and the way the boats would carve through waves, sunlight sneaking through pilot house windows, splaying currents of sun on weathered faces, women looking for signs, hands raw from loading nets, silver spun coils exploding in hands, muscles taut enough to hold dreams aloft, mouths greedy enough to toss back fire, greedy women looking for warmth, inside each other, setting the course through their own slate gray history, transcribing death in all those silver fish, suffocating in the hold of a merciless boat. In different waves, taunting women who fish in silence, throwing what's left over the side. Remember how many women you told them you loved them, how you really loved them, until you didn't anymore, until they didn't know, until you just didn't anymore. And you have those boxes in the basement stuffed with newspaper wrapped mementos of being with you, of knowing your body. But did they ever know your body, the way you liked it, the way you thought you liked it, the obscurity of what you never told them, how and why you never told them? 
how you swam away, ignorant and wild, silence squaring itself and you, believing nothing, nothing saying nothing, saying something to the mirror and the mirror cracking, telling you nothing after all. And all these memories complain, and each grasping for lies, even if you refuse them. They persist in haunting, even if you look for them, beginning every one of those moments with something less than the word defines. Reckless knowing, words circling the brain without anything in particular, without knowing what is missing, words with flesh and bone in them, Heat, backlighting, lip and tongue in them, cheek and lash in them, touch of skin and blood in them. Words dreaming of colliding, of caressing marks and slashes on papers, gouges in the desktop, curves and colors in them, books with that smell in them, heated wind and grass in them, desperate for more like toes in summer sand, sand more than the driftwood scattered across it, the sharpness of small stones on asphalt, the limping, thinking, wanting, lips forming letters, relinquishing accent and inflection. No more newspapers splattered with them, no more wrapped mementos in them, no more echoes, no more boxes and cellars, no more fishing, no more hooks, no more, no more. No, that's a very old one. That's a very old one. I mean, I was thinking of this before. No poem for me is ever finished. I mean, of mine. I mean, people do this. I mean, they do it. They finish a poem. They send. I, I can't. And the freedom that gives me, not finishing it, is so much fun. It, it's. I could play with the words, the lines, the sounds. The it, I just love it. I just love it. Oh, so these are the Esmeralda poems. <laughs> I don't know where I got Esmeralda. She just appeared in the brain one day. And um, this one is entitled, where's Esmeralda Falls to Earth? Oh, here. Well, there's Esmeralda Goes to Summer Camp. Uh, Esmeralda, where is she? I'm so sorry. Useless details of a breakup that might be useful to note. That's a, that's a title. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Esmeralda. Esmeralda falls to earth. Through clouds and contrails, a few somersaults flipped over the Apennines before reaching Sicily to party with bony kneed grad students whose bruised knuckles and small white teeth reminded her of ferrets. <laughs> what is she wearing but the same old thing? Navy tights, marigold tunic, a small half moon leather pouch on a silken cord matching her tights. She'll sip blue Caraco martinis, watch for sharks in the shoals around the bar. After dawn, she'll write down some forgeries instead of mysteries. And lumpy and exhausted, she'll sleep in a cave, soothed by the tides of the Ionian Sea, of the Ionian Sea. The elder said she was vacuous. Esmeralda thought she was vibrant. But in hindsight, hard to hold. She'd walk a hot rock beach barefoot and thread her way through the alleys of Old Town, waiting and watching for a knife to flash in the torchlight. She'd wander the dark without a sweater, walk for miles in the snow, just to see moonlight stroke trees. Spring is always a muddy mess, waiting for grass and flowers, but animal tracks are everywhere for her to follow. The elders say it's the most efficient way to grasp an animal's habits and intentions. For, those, for Esmeralda, those tracks are life itself. Dreams to be secreted away. Myth four. Esmer Esmeralda lands in the truck lot behind the Bayonne Mall. 
smitten by the light chuff of snow and rosy gray sky, she studies the tangles of telephone lines and the black braids of PSE and G hung and slung from poles to buildings. Arms akimbo, Esmeralda considers a flock of gulls bickering over dumpsters. Feeling the swooning wind over her head, she asks herself, who is coming and why? Perhaps it's Aphrodite. Esmeralda goes to summer camp. <laughs> None of the other kids are, t are as tall. They fit nicely in their bunks. Esmeralda's bunks is just another box her bones don't fit in. The other girls disdain Esmeralda. She lounges around in boxer shorts, eats Munster cheese sandwiches after lights out. She avoids macrame classes and slings off, sings off key at the campfire sing-alongs but never minds carrying the dirty linen sack to the laundry where there is Miss Klim. Now she can pitch a horseshoe and run the 5K in thin green Nikes and is sweet on the cook, Mrs. Malibu. Cute kitchen whites. Sometimes Esmeralda sneaks out to the smoking campfire once she stirred the embers and stayed till midnight. Sometimes she nestles in a dinghy watching the prow nuzzle the fog Silver River. Once she heard Cook and Miss Clem making their way to the dock and paddling off, drips of river, river rustling, then quiet lapping, rent by the loon's soft, eerie moan. Keep going? You know, you usually only read for 20 minutes. <laughs> and you usually read with somebody. Um, all right, I'll do this one. A this one's titled A Subtle Madness. And I wrote this when I was uh, still working at, at New York University. Maura Jean Gingrich from Albany, New York, was five feet nine, had dark brown eyes, and favored velvet leggings and faux pas leopard skin leotards. She was the student assistant I inherited from my predecessor who had quit midway through one of those long, endless projects well-endowed university libraries were known to indulge in. But I liked multitasking and doing things other people avoided. NYU is my alma mater, mater and had been my last employer before I divorced the only man I had ever been with. He was cute, he was older, he owned a Burgundy Morgan Roadster complete with a wide leather strap that secured the hood, black running boards, and a spring suspension. We sold it so that I could finish paying for my last semester. After I left him, I went to Denmark and stayed for almost two years. When I got back in the mid-70s, I called my own boss, my old boss at NYU, and as luck would have it, there was an opening. Before I went to college, I had gone to only one school for 12 years, an all-girls Catholic academy. All of my sisters went there. We could jump out of bed at 7.45 and make the last bell at 8.15. But to this day, I struggle with a vague sense of unease when faced with the complications of dressing for success, and my color schemes still tend towards navy and white. After the freedom and detachment of Europe, I decided that routine was a wonderful thing. I found I was thinking way too much about too many things I couldn't explain. I was reading only books written by women. I immersed myself in the poetry of Adrienne Rich and Minnie Bruce Pratt, and I started therapy with a woman whose ad I saw in the Village Voice. She had an office on Gramercy Park, and every Monday afternoon at 1.45, I pushed open the heavy padded door with creaky hinges, sank into an overstuffed blue chair, and tried to explain why I was thinking what I felt and how I felt when I was thinking it. At 12, 2.47, I'd close the big black door behind me and head back towards the university. Mondays were maddening. Mondays were reassuring and maddening. But Maura Jean Gingrich, that was really her name, 
with a large shiny safety pin embedded in her beautiful smooth cheek, a $400 racing bicycle and dark chestnut hair was all that was needed to disrupt my carefully measured life. The periodicals periodicals department was a blend of career librarians, MLS candidates, and former students like me who had stayed on long after our work-study grants had expired. The landscape of my journals began with L and ended with Q. I sat between Nina and Rochelle and directly across from Hassan and Pete. If I turned my head just a little to the left, I had a clear view of the back room where dour Marilyn supervised the work-study students, sulked and harassed her minions. She always had a cold and wrote memo after memo detailing the tardiness, deportment, and fetching skills of the students she tried to control. But she was also the first person I ever met who brewed Melita coffee in a drip pot. Marilyn detested Mora for reasons unknown, and because Mora was working on my endless project, Marilyn obligingly detested me too. Marianne, Mora said to me one early in our collaboration, do you have any idea how long it takes to ride a bike from New York to Boston? No, I said, and dragged a box of back issues of anthropology journals over to the work table. We were in the back end of the stacks, and the constant jingling of the six or seven silver bracelets on her wrist was very annoying. I'm going this Friday. Where, I asked, to Boston with Andrew on our bikes. I'm going to meet Buckminster Fuller's daughter. Andrew took her to the senior prom. We'll take the train back. Good idea, I said. But they were gone for a week and had dinner with Buckminster and his daughter. On the way back, however, they had a terrific fight. Andrew's black eye was incredibly hideous, but he was very discreet about what happened when he explained it all to Jim Fabrizio and me at the regular Yuka games we had in the staff room every Tuesday. On Wednesday, Mora was more forthright about it. I caught them together, she said. She told me as she pulled damaged journals from the shelves and threw them in a box, right there in the old boathouse where Buckminster was explaining the practical genius of Inuit design. I arranged the abused journals and closed it up and taped it. So where was Mrs. Buckminster, I asked her. Somewhere, she said and sat on the table. They pretended nothing happened. Do you believe that? Are you together? Well, we're supposed to start living together this spring. I stretched masking tape over the top edges of the box flaps. Maybe not, I said. In the background, I could hear Marilyn talking to Jeffrey and Rochelle's high ringing laugh. I knew Maura was staring at me and fingering her safety pin as I heaved the box into a library cart and pushed it towards the elevator. <clears throat> Who do you live with, she asked me, your mother? I pushed the up button and turned to face it. None of your goddamn business, I said. The doors opened and I pushed the cart in. When I turned around, she was still staring at me, her lips curved in a queer, thin smile. She was wearing her green velvet leggings and a faded black danskin. The doors closed slowly, and the vision of her was compressed into nothingness by the polished steel. As the elevators lifted, I involuntarily looked down. I knew she was standing there looking up. I knew she knew I was looking down. The fact that I did live with my mother and grandmother, but in the apartment upstairs from them, and I certainly didn't have dinner with them every night, just several times a week and always on Sunday, <laughs> along with all my other sisters and their assorted husbands and offspring. I was perfectly content to be where I was. Being Auntie Mary suited me just fine, and besides, my mother was a lot more interesting and fun than most people I knew. I was still fuming over Mora the next morning when I saw Andrew on the PATH train. He was standing by the rear door reading Phyllis Chesler's Women and Madness. He smiled when he saw me, his black eye like a hole that had been blasted into his face. Now that's an interesting tome for a guy to be reading, I said as I moved to stand next to him. Not really. Mora said I'd find it interesting. <laughs> really? Why? He flipped through some pages. Here, he said without looking up. The lesbian's yearning for her mother's love is always put in jeopardy through the existence of a male. Phyllis Chesler wrote that, I asked. No, no, Charlotte Wolf. <laughs> love between women. Oh, okay, I said. The train turned sharply and the wheels shrieked. 
Andrew closed the book. She's really mad at me, he said. I looked around to see if anyone was listening, and then I looked at his bruised eye. I was jolted how smooth his face was, how young he looked. Andrew, I said, it always works out. Yeah, he pulled, the train pulled into Christopher Street, and he moved towards the door. Do you want to walk? No, I said, I'd like to get off at 9th. As the train pulled out of the station, I walked, watched Andrew walk towards the entrance. Then I saw Maura. She was leaning against the wall on the other side of the turnstiles. And as the car I was in passed her, she turned to look at me with that same smile on her face. NYU's Bob's Library is a huge red stone structure with an imposing open lobby that reaches up hundreds of feet. I'd heard that it was a favorite site for student suicides, but in all my years there, I never knew of one. There were only lurid legends and dark, muttered rumors that always circulated among the freshmen around finals and always involved young women who couldn't take the pressure or always left long, excruciating suicide notes for their boyfriends or fathers to find. It was a Friday afternoon, and for some reason, I had been asked to help out at the circulation desk in the main lobby, where boots and shoes scraped and clicked on the marble-polished floors. Everything in that lobby echoed. I was checking out books at a constant pace. The lines were long. It seemed as if the entire university was moving through the building. The steady whoosh of the revolving door was rhythmic. I had only an hour left before I could leave. Time had passed quickly and nothing was wrong. But all of a sudden, I felt terribly uncomfortable. I felt as if someone was watching me. I looked up and saw Maura standing in line. It was a very long line that snaked from the revolving doors to the circulation desk. She was wearing her green velvet leggings and a bright white starched shirt, the kind Shakespeare might have worn, or Catherine Hepburn in Sylvia Scarlet, full sleeves, open neck, the slightest hint of a band collar. Her safety pin gleamed against her cheek like the blade of a stiletto. I began to sweat, and my hands felt clammy. I noticed that Maura didn't have any books. I felt my stomach tighten. For the first time in my life, I had an undeniable, incomprehensible sense of impending doom. Eventually, Maura reached the circulation desk. I looked at her as calmly as I could. Yes, I asked her. She smiled. I said, Maura, where are your books? She stood up very tall and placed her hands on top of the marble counter. Mary Ann, she said in a loud, loud, resonant voice, Mary Ann, I am a lesbian. The next thing I knew, someone was holding my head and a guard was asking me if I was all right. Yes, I said, yes, I got up slowly. <laughs> and the guard steadied me. I looked around. The revolving doors were still spinning, but they were empty, and Maura Jean Gingrich was nowhere in sight. OK. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments about it? Or? Mary, I have a comment, maybe a question, too. I appreciate you. You appear to enjoy reading these stories. Are they bringing back memories? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. It's, um, I mean, I, I, I know not a, not a hell of a lot of writers do it, or if they do it, they don't admit it. But they, it's hard to keep your life out of it. I mean, it, when you're writing on my level. I mean, certainly uh, someone like uh, Tobias Wolf or... Uh, um, Toni Morrison, I mean, that's another 12 levels up. And it's a, it's a completely different world, which is why I like the freedom of just doing my own thing. And if I can tell myself that I've done the best I can, if I like it, if I think it's good, it, why not? Did you write? Uh, early age, like as a kid, did you like writing? Oh, yeah. And I so remember um, nursery rhymes and jingles and the little songs they taught us in first grade. You know, I loved that, that repetition. That, that, uh, um, and I, I remember trying to read 
and the Esso gas stations when it was still Esso, and they had this motto, happy motoring. And I remember the first time reading happy motoring, like. <laughs> um, and also growing up in that area, I mean, it was just so rich in everything. It was always busy. It, there's so many different kinds of people around. Um, large Puerto Rican, New Yorican population at the time. Um, tremendously uh, important black population. Uh, uh, subcontinent Indians moving in. And all these restaurants, you know. And uh, shops and stores and kids in school. Kids would be filtering in. I remember the first black kid in school. Um, yeah, I was, uh, you could, I could, for a quarter, I could get into, I could be at Washington Square Park. You know, it was just, or uptown to the museums. It was a great place to grow up. It really was. And, you know, it had, a, it had its dark side, too. It was a city. But um, I think as we get older, time, time goes faster. Or seems to go, we perceive time faster, but also we perceive time past as more romanticized and softer and, oh, you know. So it's a mixed bag. But yes, I, I really, I really love it. I really love it. And I, I still do the editing and the copy editing, and uh, um, I'm mentoring a couple of writers. So it's, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. What are you working on now? What are you working on now? Right now, I'm reading. I'm reading, 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 reading. When, what? Um, I'm reading Parting the Waters. Um, I'm reading Jill Lepore's um, History of the U.S. Um, I'm reading, um, I just finished a biography of Martin Luther. Not King, the other Martin Luther. Because I'm reading about Martin Luther King Jr. And he, he, he had a really serious theological training. So of course, I want to know what they're talking about. So I have to go. And, and that's, that's another thing I really love about being verbal. And, and I, it just never ends. You just connect the dots. Mary, do you have a favorite writer? For many, many years, it was Adrian Rich. And now I cannot say that I have a favorite writer, because there's so many. Toni Morrison blew me away. Um, James Baldwin. Oh, I have a James Baldwin poem. I have a James Baldwin poem. Am I? I'm over though. I don't want to speak for the group, but I do have James. Oh, and I just found another. Ah. Come on. I have an Augusta Savage poem. Does anyone know who Augusta Savage is? She was a uh, Harlem Renaissance sculptor, black woman. Um, uh, well, like many women in the, um, the Harlem Renaissance, they were uh, overshadowed by the success of men and the, the power of men uh, to make the connections and get the, get the work. But um, she, was, she was a renowned sculptor. She studied in France. She had a sculpturing school in Paris for something like 15 years. She came back and was ignored. And when, this? this was... Uh, she was a t contemporary of Nora, uh, uh, Nora Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston, thank you. Um, their eyes were watching God. Um, and she wound up living in a, well, I'll read you the poem. Oh, there's a little preview by, uh, intro by uh, Angelina Grim Weld Grimke. Drop by drop, great tears splash upon my hands, and save you saw them shine, you would not know I wept. 
years of success in Paris and New York and accolades and awards. She was everything she was born into and reared out of, damn uppity and smart and wound up, the sure strikes of hammer against stone, her terrible eye, the rough physiognomy of her people illuminated. But then the farm upstate, the obscurity and the silence raging, the Renaissance moved on downtown to bread lines and memoir. She took a pickaxe, went into our studio, smashed everything to smithereens. She did. Which is very interesting. Well, I mean, we, we all know women poets are self-destructive, right? And sex. And the earlier they committed suicide, the more famous they are. I'm, I, and I don't mean to be. It's, it's awful. But um, when you think about the, um, the complications of race and those equations, it's just unbelievable what they, uh, what they went through and what they did to not only survive, but to make their art. But you mentioned that you, you're constantly writing and rewriting. Do you um, ever get rid of the, I mean, it's so easy with a computer, you know, or you could go back to the history to get to the, but do you, do you do that? And if you do that, how do you feel about doing that? Do you feel you've um, done something to that original? I might have an poem? example. No, I don't. But um, if I'm do on the computer, yeah, I just revise it. But I also do a lot of hand okay. writing first. And I always date them. And if I do a revision, I date it um, of the revision. But I found sometimes I get confused with the revisions. If I don't keep them in you know, strict order, was this the first revision or the second? You know, Even with the date, I'm not sure. Um, and I finally got a shredder. <laughs> I used to make fun of Elizabeth with her shredder. <laughs> now I got a shredder. Because mm. I mean it. <laughs> you know, with all the. So that original poem just morphs into something else, and that's OK. That's On the other okay. hand, my journals, I have them since I was in high school. Okay. And there's a lot of. Uh, sketches in there and, and poems and stuff. And then there have been times I've remembered something and went back and found it in there. And then I was able to bring it into my present and do something with it. It's like a whole new world. All, all the visual stuff that you just gave us tonight is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Then I, then I did my job. Yeah. <laughs> did my job. Yeah. Do you go to any like writers' workshops and things? Like, there's so many around. Um, getting my MFA was definitive proof that you don't need an MFA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, right. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I had great um, <laughs> instructors, um, but it's a business. It's a business. And um, I, did res I did have some resentment, I have to admit, at the, um, the selection of the next star that was already selected the first day of classes. Wow. And then they're, you know, they're groomed along and nurtured. Now, if you happen to be that star, it's got to be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But it. It did have um, some negative response. I mean, there was some negative energy from that kind of a system, and I thought it was I thought it was unfair. Was this a Vermont College? Yeah. Hmm. Who now moved to Colorado? Yeah, don't worry, they moved. <laughs> yeah. Just in time for all the mountain they, wildfires. I mean, they moved. Knocked themselves yeah, out. Yeah, Colorado College. Yeah. Colorado's out west, right? Yeah. Mountains. Yeah. Fires. <laughs> But um, okay. thank you. Yeah.
We got broadband. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you have to go. That was great. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for coming, really. Thanks for coming. Good to see you. Good to see you.